All right, so thank you everybody for joining us. I'm sorry we're getting just a couple of minutes late here. Um, so welcome to the Skills Lab. Uh, my name is Kent Gillum and I am a Principal Adoptions Program Manager for the Luminate Online and Team Razor products uh, here at Blackbaud. Uh, just so you know, this session is meant to be interactive, so definitely don't be shy uh, in this session. Uh, your expert instructors or instructors in this case will be taking you step by step as you learn a new skill during the skill, skill lab, sharing their learnings um, along the way and going deep in today's particular topic, which is talking about uh, Participant Center 3 um, and um, ways to improve the engagement. Um, if you have any um, AV difficulties, please make sure you chat that into chat. We do have somebody monitoring chat for AV difficulties. Um, a lot of times, though, it's, it's a simple um, exit and re-enter and then get that thing to reload, uh, I've found works out pretty well. So without any further ado, I'm excited to announce to you today's experts. We have Mark Becker, who is the founding partner of Cathexis. And if you've been to any of our DevCon things before, or BBCon or any of those, you obviously have probably heard or met, met Mark before. And today, uh, Jeff Rainier is joining him. He is the senior developer at Cathexis. So Mark and Jeff, I will pass the ball over to you guys. Thanks, Kent, and hi, everybody. Um, so we're going to be talking about PC3. Um, I am only going to go so deep, and that's why we have Jeff here uh, to get into the weeds on things um, as one of our uh, main developers. So uh, Participant Center 3, I just kind of want to set the stage on this and then quickly turn it over to Jeff. Um, but, uh, you know, PC3 uh, is great. But, you know, I always consider it like a, a blank slate, like a starting point, right? Um, like the default environment, you know, anything from the navigation to the wrapper to the, um, you know, the what to do next. Um, and Jeff's going to spend a fair amount of time on that, you know, is is great. It's using the, um, you know, conditionals, right? The uh, different S tags that you can use to uh, basically, you know, based on what someone has done or hasn't done, um, kind of help them through their journey of fundraising and participation. Uh, and the defaults are fine. Um, but with me, I don't know about you, but when I use my phone, sometimes, you know, when I want to get um, just uh, relax or get distracted, I'll, I'll pull up Candy Crush or something like that as a game. And, you know, everything on your phone these days is, is a lot more big buttons, chunky buttons, um, a whole lot less text. Right. Um, so I always think of trying to turn the PC, the participant center into uh, a lot less text and a lot more image focus. Right. Um, so you can, you know, just have big icons that represent something and then maybe a hover over state. Uh, where someone can, you know, learn more or see more about what what they're doing, like Jeff's showing me here on his screen, um, and then they can click through and, and do those things. And and you know, think about it as a competition where things are what to do next could then fall down into you know things you've done, right? What your 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 fundraising journey was. Imagine where you know you could basically work on getting everything out of the what to do next or you know to be done and um, down in the completed you know uh path um uh section uh and that would really i know me personally uh would be you know worried or always concerned when i log in and see oh wait there's another button up here that i haven't done yet so let me do that thing to get it down uh and just how a lot in my mind works a lot of people's minds work i hope i'm not alone in that um so you know it's just really making it taking gamification to a whole nother level um without um, being crazy uh, difficult to code. So um, on that note, um, you know, we're going to start with kind of a basic configuration. What uh, Jeff's showing on the, the uh, left hand side of, of the, the screen here is the default settings. And, you know, a lot of this can just be click and configured. Um, the participant center is obviously just, you know, viewable from within Team Razor uh, area. You can go in and hit the um, the participant center and, and change some of those default settings. But we're going to kind of talk about overriding some of those. And to that point, Jeff, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. I think I've um, kind of set the stage enough. Why don't you go ahead and dig in and, and show some of the, the ways that we're customizing. Thanks, Mark. Um, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so what we have here on the right-hand side of my screen is effectively um, – Think of it as a simple facade where we use CSS and jQuery 
in conjunction with reusables to create a customized PC3 homepage where we can use icons and imagery to make the, the experience the interface more engaging and create that sense of gamification and also leverage that sense of achievement as the user progresses through their fundraising campaign, raises money and engages their network. So before I dig too deep into the actual code and how we did it, let's talk briefly about what we have here. So we have these icons now. I didn't want to, you know, rip off anybody else's icons, so I'm using these uh, cute kitten icon placeholders for the purpose of creating this this demo for today's uh, presentation. And so, what what happens is the user is initially presented with a grayscale icon, and once they complete a task, the icon is reverted to its full color version. And so, we just use CSS to uh, to force the image to be grayscale. We have uh, a little div um, holding the tooltips that are visible on hover. And then we have classes that are wrapped in conditionals that set the class to be full color versus grayscale once the given task is complete. So in this case, we're talking about updating the personal page. And then we might have thank your donors, which would check to see whether or not the user has actually sent any emails from the participant center. We also have, um, you know, get a donation, which would highlight once the user has received their first donation, and it also doubles as a quick link that points them over to the email section to send an email. And so we can highlight progress and encourage interaction and engaging the network with the use of these icons. So let's take a look briefly at updating the personal page because you can see that the usual elements barring the fundraising progress meter and gifts element are absent. So what happens if somebody wants to actually make that donation? Well, they would click on update your personal page and now they can see the personal page area where they can update their content. And so I'm going to uh, add some additional text, lorem ipsum, very creative, click save. Once I'm done, I click the X and now when I'm done, I can just click on finish edits and return to PC homepage and we're brought back here. So let's go ahead and now maybe we want to send an email to thank our donors so we can click on this and it brings us to the email section and this is the usual interface. If I go to the profile tab where I can update my registration information, my event options, if you have, you know, custom registration information and or allow the, the custom reg questions to be modified by the user post registration. So let's go ahead and head back to the home page and here we can see the interface again. So the badges, the challenge badges, we can see received first donation, personal page updated, $100 raised. So the milestone badges, can be powered by conditionals that check to see how much the participant has raised and the challenge badges can be based on number for instance like receive first donation can be done based on number of donations received and personal page updated is easy enough to have a conditional just to check to see whether or not the personal page has been updated. So the idea behind this build is to keep it as simple as possible using some CSS some jQuery and relying heavily on conditionals to power the presentation of icons and changing icons from grayscale to color. So then one additional item that we added down below was the top fundraisers and top teams lists. Maybe you, you don't want to include that. Maybe you do want to just to help spice things up and encourage and foster that friendly competition. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this is actually built figure out what we did to make this work. So to start, we want to go to our homepage, uh, I'm sorry, to our participant center configuration. And so there's a couple elements that are very important to this. So first, what I've done is I defined a custom participant center homepage. And let's take a look at that. So we have this TR custom PC homepage, and I'm going to pull this up and let's go ahead and uh, Let's manage this. I'm going to open this in a new tab, click on edit content, 
and we can see we've got an S409 tag in divs, and then we've got some, some basic script that helps to uh, adjust the window size, and then some basic CSS down below. Uh, let's take a look, though, at stuff that's going to be a little bit more interesting. So let's start with the actual customized home page. So that's going to be the reuse TR custom PC homepage. I'm going to manage this. Let's edit this content and let's take a look. So we can see I've got some bootstrap pulled in and I've got some CSS embedded here. Down below, we can see my HTML and I have this what's next in a reusable and scroll down and I've got some badges here. So we can see that I'm using nested conditionals. In this case, the idea is we only want to show the most recently achieved badge. We don't want them to show all the fundraising milestones uh, badges. And so we have these conditionals nested and we're checking first to see if the uh, gift amount or dollars raised is less than and Next, we check to see if they're greater than, and we have the content if it's greater than, and then the way I've built this is there's going to be two versions of the same icon because we're checking to see if the dollars raised are greater than or equal to the given amount, and then we can so we can present the badges accordingly. So we have $100, $250, $500, $750, all the way up, scroll down to $15,000. Um, so it's pretty easy once you get accustomed to working with the conditionals to create that, that sort of nested conditional to present badges based on dollars raised. So let's scroll down a little bit more and let's take a look at some of these challenge badges. So some simple ways to create non-conventional badges for team raiser based on something other than dollars raised can be percent of goal um, because you know we don't necessarily always present a badge to somebody when they have raised or achieved a certain percentage so in this case we have 50 percent and 100 percent of goal and next we have some badges for whether or not the user has achieved their first donation or received their first donation. And so we also now have some conditionals to check whether or not the personal page has been updated. We have a badge for whether or not the user is a team captain. And then we can also leverage group conditionals to power some other sort of miscellaneous function. So let's say you have um, an app for your team raiser event. And let's say then also that you're using uh, some sort of import to add users who complete certain behaviors within the app, you're going to add them to a group in cons 360. So then we can use a group conditional to display a badge once someone has completed a certain activity within the app. So this is all supposed to be non API, very simple, basic customizations but making it really easy, therefore, to, to gamify and incentivize your fundraisers. So you might want to have um, some sort of legend or you might want to display these badges in grayscale and then convert them to color. The way that I have this currently set up is these milestone and challenge badges are hidden until they're achieved. And then once they're achieved, they display in color. So you might want to display them all in grayscale and then convert them to color once they've been achieved and having them in grayscale lets your users know, OK, I have these items, these achievements I can work towards and they'll become full color once I have achieved them. And then we scroll down and we have some basic um, uh, S tags. Well, we're using E tag, which is a, an evaluated S tag to to pull in the uh, a, a custom session value and so this is useful if you wanted to create something like this to work across multiple team raiser events uh, rather than having to hard code your team raiser id into your conditionals so we have our top 
part uh, our top fundraisers list and our top teams list. And then as we scroll down here, we can see that um, the return to uh, finish edits and return to PC homepage and that update your personal page title. And then below that, we have a reusable that holds our scripts that which is really just our jQuery that powers all of this. And so jQuery is what we use to apply custom IDs, custom classes, and to hide certain elements um, of the default PC homepage, as well as to create the custom function that powers something like update, clicking on update your personal page, hiding all that custom content and displaying the update your personal page area, as well as powering that finish edits and return to PC homepage. So let's take a look uh, at the reuse uh, demo scripts. So let's go ahead and in a new tab, let's take a look at this. So when I edit this, we're going to see some very basic stuff. And so there's a bunch of stuff that's commented out and that's because a lot of it is not needed. Um, some of this is carryover from from other builds that I've done, but let's take a look at what's pertinent, what's relevant here. So we've we're we're, we're using jQuery to apply IDs, to apply classes, and um, then we also are doing things like uh, adding some text. We also are. Um, let's see, where do we have this? Um, Further down, we are moving things around. Um, let's see if I can find that. Um, but using things like uh, insert after or prepend. Um, so trying to keep it very simple using very basic jQuery functions and calls to do things like move the content around once we have applied those custom IDs to create those hooks for us because typically those don't exist. So what we have also done is create a delayed execution um, where we have a set timeout function and you'll see that that happens if you look closely across some of my uh, various functions. So we can allow things to execute after the participant center has fully rendered. So I can add classes or IDs before the uh, delayed execution, and then I can move things around and shuffle or hide them once the participant center has finished loading. And so if you've ever tried to customize the participant center, you know that that load time can present some barriers to getting this customized exactly how you want. So. That's why we have the timeout function allowing us to to hide that hide things, move things, whatever we, we need in a given instance. So that's that's all it is. It's all very simple jQuery calls. Let's take a look at our uh, reusable oh, wrong wrong tab. My apologies. Let's take a look at the CSS. Let's go ahead and a new tab. Open our demo styles. And oh, sorry about that. There we go. So again, this is nothing, nothing magical. It's just using basic CSS to create the colors for things like the titles, the buttons, the progress meter setting. You can do things like setting custom fonts using things like Google Web Fonts. So you can really make this your own through some very, you know, kind of everything from rudimentary to intermediate um, uh, tools. So if you didn't want to go full custom participant center homepage, you could just use CSS and fine tune the colors and the fonts and get that really matching your brand. And then you can take it the extra mile using jQuery to fully customize that participant center homepage. So this doesn't have to be anything mysterious or miraculous even. Now let's go ahead and take a look back at the participant center. So in addition to using the embedded uh, reusable to hold styles, you can use um, 
oh, wrong one, custom styles. You can use uh, the custom.css uh, um, area to, to bring in styles if you want. So the benefit of using the CSS reusable, of course, is that you don't have to go into the participant center area and you can also have versioning for your changes as you implement new iterations and improvements or updates to your custom participant center. So the, the custom CSS can work just fine. You might prefer to work this way. You might not. I personally like having the page builder versions to help keep track of changes that I've made and also to make it easier to just do the work. Because if you're working in an environment that has a large number of participant centers, then the participant center tab can take quite a while to load just because it, it takes the system a while to pull that pull all of those up, list them, and allow you to actually get at it. So Page Builder is much more responsive um, in terms of being able to find and locate your reusables. So I just prefer the, the reusable method, but um, this is, uh, it's good to know about. And you might also want to dig into the custom JavaScript uh, area. Um, again, I prefer using the reusable method, but this is here. I just wanted to touch on this just so that you could see what it might look like if you wanted to try and use that route. Uh, the big thing, though, is adding the first designing the custom home page so that we can denote things like I want to use Bootstrap or you might want to use some other framework for building this out. You might be familiar with something else and might prefer that over Bootstrap. So. Um, we, des we designate the custom home page so I can make calls to my bootstrap assets and pull those in. So um, something to be mindful of is you might from time to time find yourself um, needing to use a lot of assets that just don't really fit to upload into the Illuminate image library because you might spend half a day just uploading assets to the image library. If you're familiar with using the Illuminate Online FTP, you can identify the name of the folder for your participant center here under uh, step one, identify participant center and name for public folder on FTP server. And you can then upload assets into that directory if you want to compartmentalize and keep them uh, you know, organized and related. You could also create a custom folder on the FTP server for ho hosting your, your assets for your custom participant center. So, I prefer to use the FTP when I've got a lot of assets because I can just click and drag and upload everything to the FTP in one swing rather than spending a lot of time uploading images one at a time. So that's that's really the nuts and bolts of this. And I, in a moment, I'll continue to dig into some of the code and talk about how we actually do this so that you can actually see those function calls and also take a little bit more of a closer look at the what to do next block as well. So um, if you were present in the lightning round, then you saw uh, the Komen custom participant center that we created. There was a custom navigation at the top. That wasn't just this basic navigation with a lot of styles or anything. We had actually uh, used the participant center wrapper and placed HTML here. And it tells you best practices that you should only use this for branding and not navigation. However, if you want to avoid having to do API builds, if you want to avoid having to go into the FTP and mess with the actual participant center uh, HTML files, you can create a persistent navigation that will exist across all of the PC3 pages by placing your HTML here. You can't place any jQuery or any sort of functionality here. And so you have to use things like the custom JS area for uh, ho hosting your custom navigation functions, if, if that's, you know, if you wanna go that route. So there was also a sticky footer that you may have noticed in the Komen example, and that was coded in the custom PC homepage that we had. And that allowed it to be persistent across all of the participant center by by coding that in the uh, the custom home page that we designated. And then we have our um, all the rest of our assets being called in either via uh, you know FTP, CDN, or 
embedded within a reusable. So let's take a look at the what to do next section, since that's kind of the star of the show for this um, for, for this demo. And so let's take a look at this reusable. Uh, I'm going to keep that pulled up, but open a new tab. Here we go. And let's manage this and we're going to edit this. And so when we look at the code, it's going to look a little bit like the badges that I demonstrated earlier. So here we just have um, a, a bootstrap div and then we have our nested divs and then we can see a bunch of different code. So we have um, a tags, we have our image tags, and what makes this work in terms of gamifying it are these reusables, or I'm sorry, these conditionals. And so we're checking to see if certain conditions are met to determine whether or not we have a specific class. And so once the class of complete is rendered, then the icon will convert from grayscale to full color. So we have things like, you know, if they've sent emails, um, if they're in a group, um, and you could also use the Facebook fundraiser ID S tag to determine whether or not the user has connected to, to Facebook. And so you could convert an icon to full color once they have actually connected their Facebook to that connected their fin fundraiser to Facebook. Um, and maybe you are using um, an app or you want to have like get social, maybe you want to point users to a toolkit that you have. And so you could use something like added interests um, or adding users to a group to identify whether or not somebody has downloaded something. So you could put it behind just a simple survey, say you could click on get social, take them to a custom survey and they they make an, a selection. And once that survey submits, they're taken to the thank you page and then you can present the options for them to download something like icons or logos, or you might have pre-baked social media uh, content like text and messaging for them to use your for, for your partic participants to use on different social media platforms. So you can not only present uh, things like um, pre-made email templates, but you can present a lot of uh, custom messaging for them to use. Take a lot of the legwork out of it for them, make it easy for them to just copy and paste and tap into their network so that they can start raising uh, funds on your behalf. And so it's really very simple. You'll see that it's all just basic. We have group conditionals, we have fundraising percent and email sent. So this is all very simple once you get down to the nuts and bolts of it. So let's talk about how we've actually made things work. So for instance, the update your personal page, There's you'll notice that it's just an A tag, there's no href. So we're not creating a link, that's just for the sake of consistency across the build. Um, but the thank your donors icon and get a donation, there you'll notice there is a link. So I'm gonna highlight that for you so you can see that. And so that's just creating a link that points the user to that page within the participant center. So if you wanted to know how to obtain that, you can inspect element on the email icon and you'll see the URL here under nghref and you'll also see href equals. So you can grab that and then apply that to your HTML to create a custom link to point to that specific page. So for instance, um, Another cool thing that you can do is create a make a personal donation icon. So you might not have tapped into the user's uh, urge to jumpstart their fundraising during registration, but you can create that as an achievement here or an action on using one of these icons. And so when I click on this, it's going to open a new window and it takes me to the donation form and my participant my test participant is Bruce Wayne. And so this takes me to the donation form for this team raiser event. And it's already configured to make a donation on my on behalf of myself. 
So that's how, you know, one way that you can encourage users to make a self donation. And, you know, that's always useful to have, even if they have made a donation during registration, that's still something that's worthwhile keeping on your participant center. Um, so let's take a look at that. And so that is self donation here. We can see the tip make a personal donation and we can look at the URL for that. That's just a basic, simple, standard donation form URL, but we're using uh, E tags and S tags. So um, we have SADTRID that's pulling a custom session value that we set so that we can use this across multiple team razor events. So the uh, this S tag S42 or e, in this case E42 team razor ID form ID that will render the form ID for the don't uh, for the team razor event in question. And then we have our proxy ID, which needs to be the 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 ID of the participant who should be credited with the donation. In this case, it's going to be S1 cons ID because we want it to be that user's constituent ID, which is also their uh, participant ID in TeamRaiser. And if you're familiar to uh, dissecting the URL on a personal page in TeamRaiser, you'll know this as PX ID. So um, that's how we pull the proxy ID. And then we have proxy type of 20, and then we have FRID finally again as as our SADTRID value. So you'll see this um, TRID come up a lot. Again, that's how we keep it dynamic across Team Razor events. So um, I encourage use of groups and or interests um, depending on what you're building and how you're building it. Um, one downside to using groups is that most users won't see a group designation update be reflected on their participant center until they've logged out and logged back in. And so groups work well if there's something that's done via something like a data sync overnight or done by manual import. But if you want something that's going to instantly show up where the user can go complete an action and then come back to the participant center all in the same session and see that reflected in their badges or whatever it may be, then you'd want to use interests. And so you can flag an interest ID on a URL so that if somebody clicks on, on an action, um, clicks on a link, um, either in the participant center or some other page while they're logged in, that will automatically flag the interest on their constituent record. And then you can use that to power your, uh, your conditionals. And so one thing that you could do, for instance, is maybe you have a unique donation form and you promote that donation form only within the participant center. Once the user makes a self donation through that donation form, and then there's a button on the thank you page, that you can you you can use that custom button on the thank you page to flag an interest. So um, if you're using surveys to, for instance, record mileage, maybe you're having users submit the number of uh, steps they took as part of a virtual walk, and you want to have a badge that shows I've walked a thousand steps, ten thousand, twenty thousand steps. You can use a survey to either record custom data to the constituent record or you can use the uh, information like um, just completing it. So you might have a survey that says um, submit the, you know, com complete this survey once you've completed your steps for the weekend and or as part of this step challenge. Once the user submits that survey, you can flag an interest on their record for completing that survey using a hidden interest update. And then you can use that interest to power the badge. And so the cool thing about some of these badges, and unfortunately, because we're covering the participant center, I don't have this for you today to demonstrate, but you can use this same sort of logic to present custom badges on the participant's personal page as well. So you can make this so that it's not just only on the participant center, but also reflected on the personal page. And so, 
for instance, with this Git social, one idea that you could use is um, that you might want to have um, something like downloadable badges. So maybe you want to present a high res version of the badge that they can email around rather than just using the, you know, the small, maybe 100 by 100 pixel badge that you're using here in the participant center. So you can also theoretically, if you wanted to go to the extra mile, you could point each of these uh, milestone badges, challenge badges down below. You could point those, make those a link that point to a high res version for downloading and sharing on social media and encouraging users to promote the activity and achievements that they have earned during the course of the fundraising campaign. So right now, this is just set up as boring and basic uh, badges that show up in the participant center, but it's really easy to make this a link. Let's see if I can find the right one. Um, home page and scroll down. We could just wrap the image in an A tag and point that to wherever. So maybe it's an image on the image library, maybe it's on your FTP, or maybe it's on some sort of badge kit page that you have. And maybe the badges are hidden behind conditionals so that the user only sees the badges that they've unlocked. So there's quite a few different ways that you could approach this um, to not just keep it limited to the participant center. Um, because again, what we want to do is we want to drive engagement and we want to reward the participant for what they've done. And so what we're showing here now, though, is just the basics for how we can do that. There's a lot of ways that you can stretch this and make it your own and expand it into something really interesting and engaging that expands multiple social media platforms. Somebody might want to promote their achievements on Instagram, and so you obviously want to give them something larger than a 98 by 98 or 100 by 100 badge. So that's a lot of the concepts that drove this participant center design. And as you can see from what we've reviewed here so far, there's really not a lot to it so long as you understand these different pieces. And if you're a really advanced developer, you can take this and you know, go even further with it, writing all sorts of really custom stuff for your participant center. And so it's of course going to be constrained to what and what a given organization has time to plan for because creating the custom badges requires buy-in from stakeholders and your planners to devise what you're going to include. And then you also have to take the time to develop the assets for that. So you might need an in-house graphic designer or you might need to outsource that to something like a badge resource hub. So there's different uh, resources on the internet that offer, you know, free uh, iconography that you can leverage for creating your own custom badges. So maybe you've got stakeholders who are willing to come up and with and plan badges and say, here's what's going to take to unlock them, but you just don't have the means to create all the custom badges. So, you know, there, there's a fair amount of planning, obviously, that you'll have to put into this so that you can properly execute it and make it truly engaging because you don't want to just, you know, cobble together some, you know, kitten icons. They're cute and all, but you're going to want something a little bit more engaging for your actual fundraisers. So, uh, of course, you might be an organization like the ASPCA or Humane Society where uh, cute cute animal icons might work really well for what you're doing. But in case you were wondering, this is just uh, place kitten icons <laughs> are how I came up with this. Um, wanted to keep it simple, keep it cute, and keep it a little bit interesting because I know a lot of what we're covering here is really just boring. Um, unless if you're a developer like me and you find this truly interesting and fun and engaging. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's, I could spend all day getting into the nuance and there's not to, I don't know that that's really beneficial for everybody, but, um, you know, something to consider is um, when using something like Bootstrap, you can make it really easy to um, make these icons and the imagery a little bit larger, a little bit more thumbtack friendly by using the custom classes. I kept it really simple just at, you know, the 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 four by four um, 
for my classes. And, you know, there's, there's no need to get too in the weeds because you, you might not find that beneficial for your users. But when you're using something like Bootstrap, if you have a stakeholder like your CEO who pulls something up on the phone and says, I want these icons larger, well, you can easily, rather than having to use different image assets, you can start with a higher, slightly higher res image and then use CSS to make the image the full size of the container and then change your mobile class to make that better accommodate your CEO's requests for larger, easier to tap icons on the participant center homepage. So Bootstrap really helps expedite development of something like this. And so, like I mentioned earlier, you might have a, um, a, a framework that you prefer. And I would recommend using whatever you prefer based on your own comfort level. Because if you want to do something like this on a budget, um, and not have to get into doing things with the API, then starting with whatever framework you're most familiar with is the best approach to do it. And that allows us to engage the design concept of KISS, keep it simple, uh, keep it super simple. And so um, I really like to do as much as I can without having to la tap into the API, just because it also makes it easier for somebody else who comes along who might be new to your team, who might not know Luminate APIs, but does know HTML, CSS, and jQuery. This makes it really easy for them to jump in and make improvements. And when you make copious use of comments, it makes it even easier for, for users who who come um, after you to follow what you've done and how to find it. And so I didn't do as good a job using comments um, in this demo build as I normally would or as I would like to. But, you know, we can see start badges block. We can see dollars raised badges. We can scroll down and we can see our percent of goal badge. We can see first donation badge, personal page updated. And this also makes it easier for somebody who wants to come in and take a look. We can see our dollars raised badge. We can see our badges block. If I look over in this other column, I can see my percent of goal badge. And so when you use comments outside of your conditionals, this also makes it easier to troubleshoot. You might have somebody who reports that they completed an, uh, an achievement and isn't seeing a badge. Keeping those comments in place outside of your conditional allows you to see where that should render, and then you can start digging into the participant record, the constituent record, their donation history, things like that, to start figuring out why these badges might not be showing up or why the what to do next icons may not be properly highlighting as expected. So hopefully these are things that you've you know, smoothed out before launching, and hopefully you're not receiving, uh, you know, troubleshooting and QA sort of uh, feedback from your participants. But good use of conditionals makes it easier for you if that does arise, and that is a situation that you find yourself having to deal with. So, um, you know, there's. Um, let's take a look here. Let's see how this looks on the front end. And we can see that I didn't do a good job of commenting all of these. So I have to infer this. I'm deeply familiar with it, so it's easy for me, but oh, I got logged out. So let's go ahead and access my PC. And OK, so here we are again. So um, again, comments are very useful for troubleshooting your custom build, and I highly recommend it. So you might also want to include that in things like um, your your jQuery based on you know how you built it out. Um, I forget exactly where that is. It should be right here. So we can see a bunch of commented out stuff. We can see you know some console law. We can see when the custom load functions start. We can see how we've applied a bunch of you know custom classes using the Bootstrap framework. We can see how we've you know added IDs to things like the progress meter so that I can move that and the fundraising gifts block up above my what to do next. Um, so 
this is how the the um, the custom jQuery looks on the front end when we're looking at it in the uh, DOM editor, the, the DOM Explorer, the dev tools. And we can see how we also have our uh, delayed run executions, 100 milliseconds, 700, 500, 800. And so different, different actions might need um, more time than others. And it also allows you to keep different functions separate based on whatever the needs are for your given build or whatever function that you're trying to create. So um, there's a lot that you can do with this and you don't have to go over the top. You don't need to go full JavaScript. You can just keep it really simple jQuery. You can call in, um, I think it's jQuery 111 will, uh, is all that's needed to, to do something like this. And that should be found natively, I believe in your Luminate FTP. Um, and if not, if you need something a little bit more advanced, uh, a newer version, then you can use a CDN or you can, um, add those to the FTP and call them from your FTP. But if you take a look at my homepage, um, well, it's commented out right now, but uh, we we used uh, Bootstrap CDN. I think I wanna look at the custom homepage. Here we go. This is, here's, we've got um, the the Google API CDN to pull that in. We have the, the Bootstrap CDN. Um, so we can pull these in from wherever we need to based on our needs, based on the framework we're working with, and based on whatever you know potential licensing you might have um, for, for your own custom framework. So the, the means of pulling in an external library and framework to power this can be done really easily just by inserting them as a standard script call here into your uh, your custom homepage. And again, this is just uh, assigned within the participant, uh, within the team razor config as a reusable. And so if we needed to, you know, again, I mentioned having page versioning, we can always copy version when we want to update to use a newer version of jQuery, a newer version of our framework or if we're working with our CSS, our uh, jQuery, whatever it may be, we can really easily just copy version and then make our changes. So this build keeps it simple to have fallbacks, makes it easy to call in those external libraries and frameworks. And it also makes it easy to iterate on our build as we move forward and refine what we've done. While at the same time, keeping things as simple as possible so that it's easy for you to, to troubleshoot and fix. It's easy for anyone else to come in later and figure out how it works, but it also makes it easy to expand, add new challenges, new goals, and new milestones or achievements. So um, that is really basically all that I have for today. And so unless that there's any other questions, I'm not sure, you know, um, Mark yeah, or Kent. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. That's that's awesome. You know, and and just kind of to put a little bit of a, a rounding out on all of this is just re remember that the whole purpose of the participant center is to be your main communication portal to your participants and for them to get information. So you know, maybe even adding a you know um, breaking news section or you know you know putting in regular updates uh, in here. Um, obviously, the, the the top fundraisers, top teams, those kind of challenges, everything for gamification, kind of keeping um, the challenges in place. Uh, but just remembering that the, really the goal of this is to be the home base for your participants um, to, to use, even if they're not using the email functionality or even reading your emails so much. Um, hopefully, if they're true fundraisers, right? If there's a fundraising minimum or if they're just dedicated to the cause and fundraising, they're going to be in here. So use this area, use it wisely um, and um, think about kind of different ways to, to make it more um, interesting or, um, you know, interactive for folks. Um, I don't know, Kent, anything else to add? No, not really. I, I will say one of the things I always love about y'all's builds, though, is that it's, it's not going off the rails in any kind of crazy direction. 
Um, I've been around 14 years in this. I saw when you first did this kind of custom badge thing. I think it was with Animal Humane Society, maybe like 2012 or something like that, almost like 10 years ago. And I can tell you that design has gone through all of these updates that Luminate has done and Team Razor has done, all of the different things from PC1 to PC2 to PC3, and it's always maintained. And so that's one of the things I think I, I, when I was watching this, I really stress is that this is like upgrade survivable 99% um, of the time. And I think that's one of the big things I love about it is you're not going to have to go back and, and spend a lot more money to, to upgrade it every time BlackBot decides to, to change something or add something. So I love it. But if anybody has any questions, um, like I said at the beginning of the session, uh, this is definitely an interactive session. So if any of you have any questions, um, if you're shy, you can type them into chat and I'm, I'm happy to read them for you. Um, but if you want to just um, unmute your mic, I think you have the power to do that. Um, I may have to unmute you. I'm actually not sure, but feel free to ask your questions if you have any questions at all. I was wondering, though, um, while we're waiting on questions to come in, I'm waiting for some hands to go up. There's a little icon up there if anybody wants to ask a question or anything, too. Um, Jeff, is there anything that you would say that you've had to really pay attention to between, you know, kind of two questions here. One is for that going from a desktop version to a, a handheld device version with this with this layout that you have. Was there anything that you'd say to be aware of in in that design that you do to, to where the desktop looks just as good as that handheld? Um. Yeah, so you're going to run into some some stuff and, you know, for the most part, we can see things look pretty good. I didn't bend over backwards for this demo to to go through and troubleshoot, but live testing is the best way to do it. You know, um, I love using the Chrome and Firefox emulation, but nothing's going to beat using your phone. And, um, you know, I it's quite frequently where I see false positives when I use the, the browser emulation with mobile. And so, you know, test, test, test using live devices whenever possible, as much as possible. And something as simple as, you know, adjusting font sizes or, you know, adjusting custom classes, um, you know, between this fundraising gifts overlapping with enter a new gift. But otherwise, you know, we can see, you know, maybe these icons could be a little bit, larger and you know i mentioned earlier you can just change that class designation to make that you know easily improved and so that's something that we can do very quickly um, to demonstrate what that would look like so here we have um, a bunch of call xs4 let's make these sixes and then we can make these icons larger and more easy to use and so i'll only do the first um, half or so for the sake of time, let's apply and then we'll refresh. And now we can see those icons are going to be much more thumbtap friendly. And so we can see where I stopped updating that class. But again, you know, that's one of the benefits of using the pre existing frameworks is they're built with mobile first mentality. And so the mobile functionality is already a core part of that. And so being familiar with that framework will also help and simplify when you go, when you're going through your testing process and identifying any potential uh, flaws or drawbacks to your design, knowing that there are built in tools to accommodate whatever you're seeing in your testing is it's great to have. I mean, everything's going to have good documentation that you can reference. There's a lot of resources online um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of how to forums and discussion boards that can help you troubleshoot that. But of course, again, I'm always going to advocate using a framework that you're familiar with so you don't have to spend time digging for solutions and you can do something quick like I just demonstrated where you just change the class to, to accommodate that particular uh, uh, break point. So, you know, that's that's what I would point out for for mobile design is test, test, test and don't just rely on your emulation and then coupling that with familiarity and also knowing where to go to get help 
when you run into issues with that framework because you never know there might be some sort of weird issue with jQuery conflicts and or something else depending on what you're bringing in to help create that custom functionality. Perfect. Yeah, and I know definitely gamification has been huge and people I, I've, I've been to CSM for the past six years and uh, working with a lot of team razor clients have a lot of them who want to be able to do this. They just kind of don't know how to dive into it, but I think I've stirred, stirred a few of them your way. Um, so uh, Kyle does have a question here. It says earlier you mentioned interest, uh, maybe web interest that the constituent can select. And I, I actually kind of made a comment while you were talking, Jeff, about the difference between, hey, if you're going to use interest, make sure you use web interest, web content interest instead of email. So it's not in all your email preferences as an opt out. That's right. You know, kind of thing at the end. I just wanted to clarify that in chat. Um, and so he was talking about uh, where would you set up those interests? So I don't know if you could dive into that constituent 316 interest and show him that real quick. Sure. I think I may have just jumped in a little too quickly. Let me let me walk through it slowly. So from the admin homepage, go to con, uh, constituents 360 and then click on interests and then click on create a new interest category. And then you will name this. Uh, we'll call this PC demo interest. And then we can add a description if needed. You can add an optional security category. And here's here's the 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 main thing for what we're talking about, choosing the interest type. So you can choose to make this an interest choice for email opt-in or make this an interest choice for web content. So choosing web content is what you'll want to do for this. And then you can also create an interest group. And I recommend using interest groups, at least at least an interest group. You may not want an opt out group for this because that in most cases, I don't think that that'll really make sense for this sort of build. But one of the benefits of using groups is easy reporting and it gives you an easy hook if you want to run queries post season. So let's say at the end of a fundraising campaign, you have a stakeholder that wants to know how many people achieved a particular challenge or badge or whatever it may be. You can easily look at a group. You can use groups as um, a constituent, uh, as I'm sorry, as a query clause. And so the groups really make it easy. And so the interest is really key though for creating that functionality so that you can flag the interest, but the group is really important for being able to report on it after the fact. And so let's very quickly, you know, because we don't want to just talk about, you know, this is what you can do very quickly. I'll show you um, if I want to run a query and I'll just use um, any query. So add an, uh, a group clause and I can use a member of and then search for the group that's in question. So that's just like the easiest way. That's what I prefer to do when looking at something like interests um, and group membership. I like to use queries because I can choose what constituent info uh, data I want to include with my output. That way, when a stakeholder is asking for, you know, first name, last name, email address, and maybe snail mail address, you can easily define that with your query export. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm going to lean towards query rather than something like, say, reports, just because I have the, the ease of use for determining what cons 360 data gets included with that CSV export when it comes time to to report on that at the end of fundraising season. Right, perfect. Um, and I know we have just a like I don't think we're going to get booted out of here just so you all know I don't Mark Jeff do you have to be anywhere right now. I got one more question for you if you have time. I have yeah, time. Let's go for it. OK, so uh, Francis was wondering have you customized the source PC3 files in the FTP, any comment about the level of difficulties and challenges in customizing Angular? Um, so I have not. I've I've looked at them, but I just don't want to have to worry about something like a participant center upgrade causing a problem for the custom customizations I've done, and that's one of the reasons for taking this approach um, that I've demonstrated here today is because. You know, um, those 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 PC upgrades, you know, they, they give you an option to, to create a new one. And, um, you know, 
if you make a mistake and you don't copy and then update, but instead update the current one, you know, you, you might be in a really bad spot for a lot of hard work that you've done. And it's, if you've looked at them before, you know that those source files have a tendency to kind of be not read. They're not very legible. They're not very readable and they're not designed to be viewed by, by even a developer. I mean, if you bring it into Dreamweaver, you, you, you know, you can beautify stuff fairly easily. You know, there's ways to make it easier to work with, but it's just, I think it's more headache and hassle than it's worth. Um, of course, you might have a project that warrants that, and you might be getting more involved than creating effectively a really cool custom facade for your PC homepage. And so, again, though, you know, I I like to avoid that because if you have to pass that off to somebody else, the odds that somebody else is going to be intimately familiar with going into the FTP, finding the source files, reading them, making heads of tails with um, of them, and being able to really work with that, you know that gets slimmer and slimmer than using the, the simple, um, you know, front end approach, um, that, that I've demonstrated here. No, oh, perfect. Yeah. And I think that kind of sums it all up. The, um, what I loved about this session is just how the, the simplified part of it. Mark, as always want to thank both of you so much, uh, for coming in here and the skills lab and sharing your knowledge, uh, with us all today. Um, just a reminder to all participants, the recording from today's presentation will be available on our Blackbod Sky <laughs> that's a mouthful. Blackbod Sky Developer YouTube channel. So make sure you're subscribed over onto that YouTube channel uh, for all the latest updates. Also, you can find a direct link to the channel from inside your event hub. Um, but we hope again that you enjoyed today's content. We hope that you'll take a quick break now. And then I think all of the presenters and stuff are getting together at three o'clock Eastern time today for a, for a meetup. So hopefully if you want to chew on Mark or Jeff's ear, you can find them around in that session as well. But Jeff, Mark, again, thank you both very much. Thank you for all the participants who joined in. Hope you all have a great rest of your uh, conference and enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Take care everyone.